Welcome back. I'm James Chan, host of the China Current and an international broadcaster. Look, you know, I was watching so much over the Asian and Middle East sections, which I was moderating. I asked the organizers whether we could stay on a little bit and bring you into the Europe and America time zone and then bring you right back at the end of the 26th hour to the UN headquarters, where, of course, the United Nations calls home. So here we are back into this new session over here. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, if you're just joining us, welcome to Leader Summit 2021 brought to you by United Nations Global Compact. I hope that you've really enjoyed the event so far and clearly many of you have and continue to. I just checked in with a team and they say over 20,000 of you are watching us live on every part of the planet and by that I mean in over 180 countries everywhere in the world. And we've got more than four, 500 speakers. So lots of range and diversity. It's really important that we get the inclusion of voices if we're to talk about accelerating the sustainable development goals. Now, through this event, you would have heard insights from Compact's new global strategy and ambitions to promote the 2030 agenda among business. You can read that full strategy and learn more about our global programming by visiting the UN Global Booth in the Hop In Pavilion. Now, what is Hop In? I didn't know what that was until earlier today. Hop In is the name, of course, of this really innovative tech platform that we're using in order to bring you together. So this is, you can look at it as a kind of a, a center of gravitation for us over these 26 hours. Uh, let's quickly tell you about how you can draw out the best from your event experience today. First off, while the main stage conversations will be in English, all the plenary sessions like this one are being translated into both Spanish and Chinese Mandarin. And of course, it's very easily accessible. We want to make that very easy for you. So simply stay on the plenary stage if that's the language support that you need. On the right-hand side, next to the chat and the polls, if you're using your laptop, it might be a little bit different if you're using uh, your mobile phone, for example, you can see a translations tab, click on that and also hit my session, choose either Spanish or Portuguese and mute the live video in Hopin and then you'll automatically hear the language that you selected. Breakout sessions are run simultaneously on the side stages. The full agenda can be found on the Hopin homepage. With Details on the session descriptions, also the speaker bios. You've got about 500 speaker bios to get through there and directions to their respective stages. Now, we said that we were thinking of 15,000 attendees, but as our numbers now update us, there are well over 20,000 of you currently watching live all over the world, and you represent almost every single member state. I think there are about 193. So through all those countries and all those communities, all those towns and villages or urban centers, we encourage you to join the conversation at this event by going to the right-hand side of your screen, connecting directly with the attendees, even the speakers here on Hopin. Now we've made that pretty easy for you. You can see them in the attendee tab along the right-hand side of the screen again. That's where you can send private messages. And if you're feeling a little bit bold in our social media era, you can even video chat them. If they decline, I'm not quite sure what you can do, but you can always try. Now, the networking session is in the navigation bar on the left of your screen, so just on the other side of that. And this will allow you to chat and connect again over video with the attendees and then make new connections. You can even share your own contact information Give it a try. You could make some new friends. And I'd like to think that anyone who joins a Leaders Summit hosted by you and Global Compact is, uh, is a person not only worth knowing, but a person you can trust as well. Now, you can see a, a little building icon somewhere there, and that's your pavilion. That's where you can explore the content studios, featuring work from all of our event sponsors and partners, thank you to them, and also to the Mentorship Lounge, where you can hear practical advice and personal stories from over a dozen impactful leaders. You can also learn more about the UN Global Compact and speak to our team in the UN Global Compact booth. And of course, you can keep the conversation going on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, wherever you want to go, it's very likely that we're there. Uh, I know that we're very active on Twitter. All you have to do to make your post stand out is hashtag it with leaders 
summit. And I also saw just before coming here to speak with you that their messages, you know, really coming thick and fast on the event wall on the Hopin platform. So go and check that out. There are a lot of people asking for help. There are a lot of people offering support. So that could be your next connection, your next way through for the organization that you represent. Now, registration Hopin will stay open all day. So feel free to share your excitement on social media and invite your colleagues, your friends, maybe not your friends. If you want them to join, they're welcome to join. And lastly, if you need to step away a bit, because we all do at some point, don't worry, all recording will be available on our YouTube page shortly after the event finishes. Now, we've got about seven very exciting hours. So that's hour 21 to 26 still ahead of us. Let's welcome the next speakers to give us a really inspirational panel on human rights and labor, inspirational, and of course, very important. This session will be divided into three parts. Number one, we're going to spend about 30 minutes on the commemoration of the 10th anniversary of the UN United Nations Guiding Principles, that's right, and the launch of the Business and Human Rights e-learning course. After those 30 minutes, we're going to hear a high-level dialogue on the urgency to translate human rights and labor rights commitments into concrete actions. We were talking about that earlier. It's all about implementation. But lastly, we're going to have a special panel on child labor. To do all that and to bring us forward, to propel us forward, it's my joy and privilege to welcome Rachel Davis. Rachel Davies is the Vice President and Co-Founder of Shift. You can check out her bio in this session. She's played a pivotal role in the development of the Guiding Principles as a Senior Legal Advisor to John Ruggie in the lead up to their adoption in 2011. So it's the 10th anniversary, the 10th birthday, happy birthday, and let's honor that anniversary. Rachel Davis, it's over to you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, James, and to so many of you for being with us. I'm really pleased to be joining this truly global discussion from Australia today. Uh, and I'd now like to introduce a short video that will kick off the session James explained. Uh, we recorded this with some very special guests to celebrate today, which is indeed the 10th anniversary of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And our guests include their author, Professor John Ruggie. So happy birthday to the UN Guiding Principles. And I'll be back with you all very soon to continue our session after this video. Thanks. I'm Rachel Davis, Vice President and Co-Founder of SHIFT, and I will be your moderator for the next 90 minutes as we mark the 10th anniversary of the UN Guiding Pr Principles on Business and Human Rights and the International Year for the Elimination of Child Labour. I'm also happy to announce that today the UN Global Compact and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, together with SHIFT, are launching the updated Business and Human Rights e-learning course, which will assist companies from every region in understanding what they are expected to do to identify and address their human rights impacts. The first of four modules is, as of today, freely available on the UN Global Compact Academy webpage. At this point, I would like to introduce you all to the four speakers who are here with us to commemorate the 10th anniversary. They bring both high level and global perspectives on the guiding principles and on the distance we have traveled since their adoption from widespread voluntary uptake through to the growing trend of integration into national and potentially regional law. Our speakers are the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, Harvard Kennedy School Professor and former Special Representative of the UN Secretary General, John Ruggie, Chair of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights, Dante Pesce, and Roberto Suarez Santos, Secretary General of the International Organization of Employers. Welcome and thank you to all of you for joining us today. The guiding principles set a standard of conduct for business, the responsibility to respect human rights. They make clear that businesses should meet this standard through due diligence processes, which must be connected to the company's strategy, business model and culture with board level attention to getting this right. The guiding principles also expect states to create an enabling environment for business respect for human rights through both mandatory and voluntary measures, including in relation to access to remedy. By respecting human rights, businesses can demonstrate their commitment to a more just and equal society. And by ending the externalization of costs onto people, companies can become part of the solution to global inequality, the greatest social challenge of our time. 
Today, June the 16th, is the actual birthday of the Guiding Principles. 10 years ago to the day, John, I was sitting with you and my colleagues on your team in the Human Rights Council chamber, uh, listening to the debate on the resolution proposing the adoption of the Guiding Principles. When you started your mandate, there was no roadmap. Uh, yet six years on, there we were, watching a diverse group of member states that don't always see eye to eye on, on these issues uh, speak up in support of the guiding principles. Beyond the UN, there was strong support as well from many in the business community and from investors. And there was a great desire from civil society that the guiding principles would help improve the human rights situation for workers, local communities, and many other affected stakeholders connected to global value chains. So, John, starting with you, as the author and the architect of the Guiding Principles, sitting in the council chamber 10 years ago, what did you envisage about where we'd be today? Uh, what has turned out as expected and has anything surprised you? Well, Rachel, you were there. So as you know, at the time I was uh, biting my fingernails um, and running around the chamber, uh, trying to uh, lobby last minute uh, decision makers um, that this really was a good thing that governments could not have put together the guiding principles themselves because they would have negotiated it down. Um, and in the end, they, uh, they, they, they agreed. It was a long road, as you said. Um, it took six years, uh, 50 international consultations, a great deal of research um, and uh, pilot projects. Um, and we did that because business and human rights was really stuck in its tracks. Uh, it was, if I can put it this way, uh, the magic of the marketplace versus the magic of treaties. And there was no relationship between them. There was no way to bridge those two. Uh, and, and those positions were deeply embedded uh, in the human rights community on the one hand and in the business community on the other hand. And states were generally in support of, of the business community. So uh, my, my job was, was to get this thing unstuck um, and try to move it in a different and more productive direction. Um, you know, it, it was all complicated and took a long time, but I think in retrospect, we can say that for business, um, there were sort of four key components uh, to bring, to make business um, uh, a, a partner in this rather than an opponent. Um, one was to differentiate clearly uh, between the responsibilities of states on the one hand and those of business on the other. Uh, in, in past um, efforts, the two had been commingled. The attempt had always been made to take international human rights law and transpose it onto companies. Uh, and and uh, with, with very little sort of principle differentiation. And that would have, that would have led to endless blame shifting on the ground as, uh, as to who was responsible for what. So differentiating clearly, you know, this is what states are obligated to do under the human rights laws that they've adopted and under the human rights regime that exists internationally. And this is the responsibility of business. Uh, it is a separate responsibility uh, and it exists whether, uh, no matter what states do. Um, it, it, it's yours, you own it. So then we had to um, establish that the core responsibility of business, the basic responsibility was to respect human rights. Now, you know, I never met a company that said we didn't respect human rights. I, they all said, of course we respect human rights. So my question was, how do you know? Uh, how do you know and can you show that you respect human rights? Um, you know, um, it's easy to say, but it's much harder to uh, to demonstrate that that you do. Um, and and so that required us to provide uh, a set of tools um, whereby uh, uh, companies uh, uh, to to promote to companies whereby they could and and, and establish the systems. Uh, within their corporate management structure to know and show that they respect human rights. And that led us to the construct of human rights due diligence. Um, due diligence is a concept that business is very familiar with, 
and, and we, <clears throat> we simply said, we're going to slightly redefine it um, in that it is an ongoing process. It's not a one-shot transactional process. Uh, it involves engaging with stakeholders um, and it is um, a, a methodology or a tool by which uh, you can assess the adverse impacts that, that a project or, or a, a new product um, may, may create. Um, and these, these impacts could occur either through your own activities or through your business relationships. So the human rights due diligence would cover the value chain as a whole. Um, through this methodology, you can avoid or mitigate actual harm that has already occurred. Um, and you adapt your conduct accordingly, and then you report. What you, what you have done um, and what it has achieved. So human rights due diligence became a core construct um, in, the, um, in the mandate, in, in the guiding principles as a way for companies to know and show that they respect human rights. Now it turns out that governments became very interested in human rights due diligence as well um, because it provided them with a specific policy tool um, that they could use to encourage business to respect human rights or to require them if encouraging wasn't, wasn't enough. If businesses required more than encouragement, they could always make it mandatory. Uh, and so governments became um, very interested um, in adopting due diligence as a way to um, incentivize or, or require uh, companies uh, to respect human rights. Um, and it also satisfied the needs of affected individuals and communities uh, because human rights due diligence required consultation with potentially affected parties uh, and taking their views into account. And when done properly, human rights due diligence reduces the incidence of harmful conduct. And so what's not to like? Uh, in this sense, human rights due diligence became a trifecta. Uh, for once we had business, governments, and, and, and affected communities and individuals interested in the same measure uh, because each saw that it was of, of uh, interest and, and, co and contributed uh, to their own um, objectives. Now, once we got that sort of intellectually figured out and written into the guiding principles, from there on the, uh, the progress along these lines was more or less as we would have uh, expected. Uh, but I think uh, it's, it's fair to say that the pace of change has really picked up in the past couple of years. And I think, I think that's due to two factors. One, we see increased uh, momentum um, on the part of governments um, to establish uh, mandatory reporting uh, and mandatory human rights due diligence processes uh, in the traditional heartland of multinational corporations. Um, and um, secondly, we see the remarkable rise in ESG investing, where the S, of course, is all about business and human rights. Uh, the trajectory of the past decade um, became part of a much larger change in society um, in the concept and the construct of the modern corporation. Um, the uh, uh, societal desire to get beyond the idea of shareholder primacy uh, and move toward uh, one of greater uh, stakeholder um, uh, input uh, and, 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 st and stakeholder capitalism, if I can put it that way. Uh, and, and on the whole, that's good for human rights, although the journey is by, by no means over. Thank you, John. And thank you for explaining how central due diligence and human rights due diligence is to this journey and, and therefore the importance of keeping the robustness of that concept uh, as we move forward to meet all those stakeholder interests. 
Um, Hi, Commissioner, let me turn to you, please. The Human Rights Council unanimously endorsed the guiding principles in 2011, as we know, and since then the Council has adopted several standalone resolutions uh, led by a core group of member states that have advanced the business and human rights agenda, uh, including by tasking your office with a number of really critical projects in this area. Um, In which ways have you and and the office seen a a shift in the attention given to this topic over the past decade? And are there specific events you see as connected to to this progress? Okay, Uh, the Human Rights Council uh, 2011 endorsement of the UN guidance principles on business and human rights I think was, as Professor Raggi was mentioning, an important milestone in the development of the international human rights framework, providing clarity about the standards of responsibility for business on human rights as well as for the role of states in protecting people against harm from business activity. The UN guiding principles have become the authoritative normative framework for business and human rights. But as important, as the endorsement itself was the ambitious program for follow-up that was included in the 2011 resolution. The Human Rights Council both created a dedicated special procedures, the working group on business and human rights with all the usual features, country visits or reporting, as well as reporting to the General Assembly. Perhaps uh, one of the most important decisions made by the Human Rights Council to put business and human rights firmly on the global agenda over the past decade was the decision to create an annual forum on business and human rights. Because this decision has allowed the business and human rights community to have a platform and a common space for sharing information, knowledge, and stock taking, as taking, uh, and in turn to grow into a powerful multi stakeholder movement for change. It has become the largest global gathering organized by UN human rights. Importantly, the active participation of business has continued to grow, and that's really important, making the annual forum into a truly multi stakeholder event. Aside from the regular renewals of the working group mandate, the Human Rights Council has also played a key role in supporting my office work on accountability and remedy. The accountability and remedy project grew out of a concern that following the 2011 endorsement of the guiding principles, insufficient attention was paid to the crucial issue of remedies for victims of business related human rights abuses. Uh, Through repeated resolutions, as you mentioned, the uh, Human Rights Council uh, has bestowed authorities and legitimacy to the work of the project. The concern about lack of uh, attention to the remedy pillar of the guiding principle was also a key driver behind the Human Rights Council's decision in 2014 to create an intergovernmental working group to develop a legally binding treaty on human rights and transnational corporations. Increasingly, the trend is that the Human Rights Council and the Human Rights Mechanism are mainstreaming and integrating the guiding principles into both thematic and country resolutions. And this is an important development that ensures consistency and alignment of expectations of business anchored in the guiding principles as the authoritative global framework. There is also a clear trend that human rights mechanisms are focusing on the role of business in their work and use the guiding principles as the conceptual and analytical framework for the work. This again enhances consistencies and alignment, which provides clarity and a level playing field for business. Having said all this, we have still seen examples of sliding back to the pre-guiding principle days. For example, while I warmly welcome the enthusiasm and commitment of many companies for the SDGs, there has been a tendency in some places to see the contribution of business to the SDGs merely through the lens of corporate social responsibility or philanthropy, rather than as an integral part of their responsibility to respect human rights. We saw some worrying signs amongst the business responses to the COVID-19 crisis of companies not embedding respect for human rights, for example, in decision affecting workers in their supply chains. We also saw more positive response with some companies recognizing their corporate responsibility to respect human rights. And I, of course, I will always encourage all companies to follow this example by placing people at the center of their decision. It is clear that building back better, that we know we cannot go back to the other normality, requires all companies to embed respect for human rights in their strategic and commercial decisions as part of the world appears to be slowly emerging from the crisis. Thank you, Rachel. 
Thank you very much, High Commissioner, and for reminding us uh, just how different the guiding principles are as a framework for making business decisions um, uh, from what we had before. Uh, so I think very point very well made. Um, Dante, uh, let me come to you. Uh, the Working Group on Business and Human Rights, um, of which we, uh, we know you're the current chair and uh, the High Commissioner has just explained the background to the mandate, um, is promoting implementation, has been promoting implementation of the guiding principles for a decade now. And you've just conducted an evaluation or a stock taking of, of the first 10 years. What are your top findings and where are we seeing some progress? But also, of course, what are the challenges uh, and the opportunities for increasing the pace of uptake by states and, and business alike? Thank you, Rachel, for the invitation and for all the other speakers to, to invite me to join this very high level uh, panel. Um, and thank you, uh, UN Global Compact, for the invitation. Uh, we are pleased to work together to promote business respect for human rights in line with the UN guiding principles. We will present as a working group our stock taking um, report to states at the Human Rights Council later this month. The stock taking report is already available in all UN languages and is the result of a very, very participatory process that took a year and a half to get it uh, together uh, with consultations all around the world from all stakeholders and almost 250 written submissions from, again, from all stakeholders. And I will say is a half full glass story. Uh, what we can say today is that all stakeholders are on board and their evaluation of the first 10 years, depending who you speak with, is more empty or more full, but is the same glass. So we are sharing the same framework and we are all understanding that it is the framework to be used. And, and we believe that that is something that we have gained uh, on solid, solid basis. In December, we will present a roadmap for the next decade based on the stock taking report that is being presented and distributed today. The wider context to our stock taking exercise is of course the global crisis uh, that we are living through, not only the ongoing uh, COVID crisis, but also the existential climate crisis, inequalities and discrimination. The guiding principles foresaw many of the key challenges we still need to overcome. The enabling environment is not there yet, except in some uh, places of the world, but certainly not in the global south yet where I'm from. Uh, neither uptake by business on speed on scale beyond pioneers. We do have the pioneers at governments and business. We do have uh, pockets of innovation and, but we, of course, have a long way to go if we look at the whole picture of the world. Ineffective prevention by states and business, especially one that is based on meaningful stakeholder engagement. Significant barriers to access to remedy for, for victims of business-related impacts. Lack of policy coherence in governments and multilateral level. Uh, lack of coherence in business practices, sometimes advocating for the right reasons and at the same time lobbying for the wrong reasons. Um, yet our stock taking clearly underlines what, uh, uh, that we are in a much better place than we were 10 years ago. Most important, the UN guiding principles provide a globally agreed standard for what governments and business need to do to embed respect for human rights in the business context. We have seen significant uptake over the, uh, the past uh, 10 years, as I said, in some locations, but nevertheless, relevant one, uh, and the ones where most of the pioneers are. Perhaps the greatest contribution is the normative expectation of corporate human rights due diligence, as it has been mentioned already several times. The mandatory wave, again, has been mentioned, with increasing backing from business and investors, can be a game changer. And of course, we expect that to trigger around the whole world beyond where it's taking place right now, which is of course promising. But as important, the due diligence norm has also been taken up by a wide range of actors that influence and shape business from financial institution and investors to business organizations, as we will have later on with international organization of employers. We need to reinforce and expand this foundation. Implementation of the guiding principles should be at the center um, of, our, uh, of a responsible recovery 
from the current crisis and to build back better. The road to a just transition to a greener economy also goes through respect for people. Yet the guiding principles will not implement themselves. We need to increase the pace of implementation. Governments and business need to do the job, supported by other stakeholders. We now call on states and business to use the anniversary year to set ambitious goals and targets for how to do their own part. We also call on business associations and platforms as IOE in this call or Global Compact, that is the host of this event, to play a reinforcing role in ensuring uptake for the guiding principles. They can do this by requiring members to align with the guiding principles and commit to human rights due diligence. This can be a true accelerator for progress. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed, Dante, for I think really sharing with us some of the global uh, uh, lessons and, and, and insights that your stock taking has captured um, and really highlighting that, that value of shared language, shared expectations, but also I think the demand for more action and we see that demand coming uh, of institutions, business, government, um, uh, international institutions uh, on a number of different issues. Not on this one, it's no different. So thank you. Um, Roberto, please let me come to you. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier today, um, the UN Global Compact and the High Commissioner's Office and uh, together with SHIFT are launching an updated uh, e-learning course to help businesses meet their responsibility to respect. And as someone with vast experience in working uh, in and with the private sector and as Secretary General of the IOE, uh, do you see the business community paying increasing attention to human rights? Do you think there is the necessary understanding of what businesses' responsibilities are? I'm in silence, now I'm on mute. Answers, the answer to your first question is yes, indeed. Answer to your second question is no. I mean, but let me just elaborate it further because I think it's important also to, to better understand the genesis. I, th I think that the good work that Professor Ruggie did is to build this big consensus. At the end of the day, it's not easy to put all, all of us together. I mean, we, we, we notice that on a daily basis. And uh, to be very frank, we were surprised when the guiding principles were adopted itself because the, the consensus that was achieved, and, and, and uh, Professor Rogge has just said that having business as part of the solution instead of just, you know, training them or training back them in, a, in, a, in an initiative which has no uh, appropriation, we have not ownership from our side. That was the key aspect. So the consensus that we have managed, that you have managed, that we all have managed, and I also want to, to thank the Global Compact, to build has a huge strength. I mean, these three pillars and the due diligence approach is really incredible as a tool to push the agenda of business and human rights. So if you remember some of the discussion, I think also Michelle referred to that, um, whether this is corporate, corporate social responsibility, whether there is just a marketing tool, whether there is a communication tool or philanthropy, those who still believe that's the case, and I believe that there are some companies who still integrated it like that, are wrong, and we have to recognize that. No longer a company which takes seriously the, the need to integrate human rights can really do it without these principles. No longer, you can expect that to do it in a kind of voluntary manner. The expectations are high and even more after the pandemic. So now that we have a situation in which everybody's talking about building differently in a much more sustainable, but we have the ingredients here. And that's clear. And believe me, it was not an easy discussion internally within the business community, but also with, all, with all other stakeholders. The challenge that we have ahead is that, of course, there are different interpretations of how to implement them. And as you said, Rachel, well, well it's your second question. In, in fact, is there a good understanding of how to integrate them? No, there is still uncertainty. We are doing a great work. We are also trying to do our best also with our guidance for SMEs. 
that's far away from enough. I mean, we have more than a critical mass of company also pushing in this direction. Uh, you already stressed the, the point of some countries also putting into place regulation with mandatory re, mandatory due diligence, mandatory reporting, the investment, the SDS, ESGs. Uh, but beyond that, the reality is that in many occasions, when you have to deal with your supply chains, you are, as a company, big, medium, especially small ones, a little bit lost. Okay, Let's re recognize that. And you don't know how really you can integrate that in an effective manner, also not exposing yourself, that's what they say, us, okay? Uh, but also doing things seriously. We always have a clear message, do not enter into a kind of communication approach, which will raise your expectation from stakeholders that you are not able to fulfill. That's the worst you can do. Every step you do, you have to, to be ambitious, but you have to do it in a coherent manner. Where is the lacking point from our perspective. And having also been experiencing different kind of partnerships, also with the UN Working Group, and Dante knows that very well. Uh, in fact, also, we, we, we try to give a big push also to the integration of the human rights principles in our, in one of our declarations, we call it the Barheim Declaration of IOE, which I think it was an important step. Um, and Dante was also with us at that moment. Uh, but the, the, the is that many of the companies that are already trying to integrate, let's say, seriously with different challenges. And I also understand what Michelle also has said in terms of this pandemic on how difficult it was for some of, of the companies to take that seriously. Uh, and we make even a call for action in the garment sector when incomes of workers were at stake because some of the companies needed to engage seriously. And we pushed this again. That was not easy. Some of them were really reluctant also to have this very well integrated. But what they are saying, and that they have a legitimate point here, is we feel sometimes alone. You know, we do the effort, but the public institutions at national level on the duty to protect are not going on the same direction. And this, I, I'm going to use a, a, a fancy word, which is connectivity, <laughs> between what companies are doing and the institutions are progressing, is it still missing? And I, I can give you many examples and finish with that. But in the ILO, we have an excellent program, which is the Better Work Program, which is excellent. And you, the companies are doing due diligence also within their supply chains, through assessment, through training, through also building capacity. But this knowledge is very often lost there. They are not building on national institutions and labor inspectors to build that and, and to have that as a sustainable path for the future. This is the connection gap that we need to face. Also when you have, and I finish with that, 60% of the occupied population in the informal sector. We need to put the ambition with the human rights to tackle the informal sector and informality in, in, with this connection between what companies are doing and with institutions, international organizations are doing. That's the main message that we have here. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, you've hi highlighted, I think, a, a number of uh, challenges that, that go on being challenges and important for us not to forget um, the need to integrate uh, this into the informal sector challenge with SMEs and capacity um, and connectivity or relationship coherence with uh, public policy. Um, but uh, I think it, it's also very clear from what you're saying that there is engagement and support from business um, now, 10 years on, still just as strong for this, this framework and this way of thinking and indeed doing business. Um, and so if I can ask you all in closing, uh, and uh, High Commissioner, I'd, I'd like to come to you first, but to ask everyone for um, uh, a final and uh, in one sentence, our main audience today, um, uh, our companies is private sector. Um, and for our audience, what is the most important uh, message that you would like them to take away, reflecting on 10 years of having for the first time a shared language, knowing we have implementation challenges ahead, uh, many of which have been have been described. Um, what would be your key messages to message to business businesses today? Hi, Commissioner, I'll start with you, please. I would say, uh, first of all, um, to guide uh, yourself uh, through the guiding principle of the UN uh, for business human rights is not only the right thing to do, but it's a smart thing to do. It will work well for you. It will work well for the workers and for the consumers. So please go ahead and don't give up. We'll continue supporting you. 
Excellent. Eloquent, short, <laughs> empowering. <laughs> uh, Dante, I'll come to you next. Yeah, um, it is possible to be way more ambitious. We have the foundations, we have the all the elements in place, we have the experience, but we need to move into mainstream. So we need to really be ambitious. And our goal for the next year, 10 years, is to move from the pioneer level to the mainstream. And um, But the good news, it is possible, we are convinced it is possible, and we have all stakeholders on the same side of history. Thank uh, you. The same side of history. Thank you. Great. Roberto, please. Precisely, that was my point, the ambition that we need, the, the ambition in the partnerships on human rights. We have more than a critical mass of companies. We have more than a critical mass of NGOs, international institutions. We have the tools. Now we have to move forward, putting this efficiency and ambitions as a priority for all of us. That's what I would really stress as a main message. Thank you. And John, as the original author of The Guiding Principles, you, you have the last word, your, your sentence, your recommendation to business. You're on, on mute. Gosh, I wasted so much time. Um, my, my sentence has three component parts. One is that there is a major game changer that is going to happen coming out of Europe. Uh, the uh, sustainable finance disclosure re uh, requirement um, and the mandatory human rights due diligence will be applicable to any company that operates in the internal market, irrespective of its nationality. So anybody who operates there is going to be subject to those rules. Doesn't matter what country the company is headquartered in. Um, so that is a big, big game changer. Secondly, five major standard setters are working on setting ESG standards, and none of them knows anything about the S. And the S is all about business and human rights. They know about environment. They know about corporate governance. They don't know anything about the S. I would encourage the high commissioner to, to make every effort to get people in that group who know about the S so that we have a real ESG, not just an E and a G. And my third point uh, is that for the first time ever, we need to develop instruments for SMEs and for the informal economy. All, everything we've done has been for large and mostly listed corporations. Uh, most of the people in the world don't work in those. Thank you. Thank you. Number of things in one sentence. As a professor, you're allowed. <laughs> uh, thank you, all of you. Um, there were many contributions. <laughs> there were. Uh, semicolons even. Thank you very much to all of you for your comments today, your time, uh, your thoughts, and also your respective leadership uh, on this agenda for championing it the way you, that you do. Um, some states are also paving the way, and to close us out today, we will now hear a special address by His Excellency, uh, Mr. Wisanu Kruanam, Deputy Prime Minister of Thailand, which was, of course, the first country in Asia to adopt a standalone national action plan on business and human rights. Excellencies, distinguished guests and participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and warmest greetings from Bangkok, Thailand. First of all, I would like to extend my sincere appreciation to the United Nations Global Compact, UNGC, for giving me the opportunity to deliver keynote speech at the special occasion uh, in order to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the adoption of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, or UNGPs. Over the years, we have witnessed a number of accomplishments by the UNGC, be they the decent work in global supply chains and peace the Justice and Strong Institutions Action Platforms, or the production of various reports and toolkits. For Thailand, 
the issue of business and human rights remains high on the national agenda. We are determined to further promote human rights in business operations in accordance with the UNGPs. The Responsible Business Conduct, or the RBC, and the Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs. Thailand became the first country in Asia to have a stand-alone four-year national action plan on business and human rights, or the NAP, since 29th October 2019, with robust support from the relevant stakeholders, including government authorities, state-owned enterprises, civil society organizations, international organizations, and business sectors. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Global Compact Network Thailand, or the GCNT, for being our valuable partners in developing the NAP, and for their valuable support in providing knowledge and resources to assist the Thai business community. As Thailand will be presenting our voluntary national review on the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development to the high-level political platform on sustainable development this July, we will highlight the achievements on the NAP as we believe that human rights and development are closely linked. We have also incorporated inputs from the Global Compact Network Thailand to our VNR as Thailand believes that the private sector is one of the key agents of development and SDG implementation. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Thailand has made substantial stride on the implementation of the NAP and UNGPs. For instance, tax reductions are offered in order to help the companies hiring formerly incarcerated persons in order to prevent recidivism and boost social reintegration. The listed companies are obliged to, to disclose their human rights practices in one report and submit it to the Securities and Exchange Commission of Thailand in order to discharge corporate accountability to their workforce. Fifteen commercial banks and the National Bank of Thailand signed the MOU on Sustainable Banking Guidelines, Responsible Lending, which reaffirms that all banking operations will be in accordance to good governance, social and environmental responsibility. Moreover, Thailand has conducted the analysis study on the anti-slap legislation with the UNDP and amended the Witness Protection Act to enhance protection to human rights defenders. Human rights awards were also initiated two years ago to recognize companies that demonstrate their respect and protection of human rights. Thailand will also continue to further encourage SMEs to integrate human rights considerations into their operations through the right incentive scheme as well as capacity building and technical assistance. It is also crucial to establish an effective mechanism to monitor outbound investment. We need to ensure that businesses respect and promote human rights during the recovery of COVID-19 pandemic, including their efforts to mitigate the socio-economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. UNGC celebrated its 20th anniversary last year, and today we are commemorating the 10th anniversary of UNGPs. This is the time to move from aspiration to action, to realize effective implementation of the UNGPs. We need to ensure that cross-cutting issues affecting the three pillars, protect, respect, and remedy, are fully addressed. A regular evaluation and monitoring process should indeed be in place to create better outcomes for the people. I am therefore delighted to see representatives of key stakeholders attending this forum to exchange views and best practices, as well as to identify challenges that remain for Thailand and its stakeholders in the implementation of the UNGPs. I would like to encourage an enhanced engagement with the United Nations Global Compact with its range of tools, such as the new business and human rights e-learning course, which will assist in operationalizing the UNGPs. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, I would like to reaffirm Thailand's readiness to work closely with the United Nations Global Compact and all partners to further progress on business and human rights. I also wish to thank all the agencies concerned for organizing today's event and wish the event the greatest success. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much to the Deputy Prime Minister of Thailand for these remarks. Uh, we've now concluded the first part of our session in which we commemorated the 10th anniversary of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And I'm very pleased to be joined for the next 15 minutes by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, again, Michelle Bachelet, and by Guy Ryder, the Director General of the International Labour Organization. The Office of the High Commissioner and the ILO are, of course, the two UN agencies with responsibility for the relevant declarations and conventions that underpin the human rights and the labor principles in the UN Global Compact. So my two guests obviously know each other very well indeed. Uh, to frame this quick conversation, I, I think we all agree that there's an urgent need for more companies to translate these principles into concrete action in order to make a real impact in people's lives and, of course, to achieve the SDGs. Overcoming the global challenges that we face today will require clear commitments, purposeful action, and also honest assessments uh, of whether we're actually delivering better outcomes on the ground. And I'd like to put my first question to you, please, High Commissioner. Uh, the current crisis, as we've heard and as we all know, is having a massive impact on the world of work uh, and is putting pressure on companies and workers alike. Some companies are facing existential threats to, to their business, and some workers are being pushed into even more precarious work or simply struggling to survive on a daily basis. How can we make sure that companies integrate respect for human and labour rights on the road to a sustainable and a resilient recovery? Well, thank you, Rachel. Well, I think there have sadly uh, been too many examples <coughs> sorry, of companies really disregarding their responsibility to operate uh, with respect to human rights uh, during the crisis. For example, civil society has documented many cases of companies who have refused to pay their suppliers for orders they made prior uh, to the crisis, and this is, of course, unacceptable. At the same time, it is important to support all well, and recognize at the same time the companies who have acted responsibly during the crisis. Uh, we also need to stress that uh, there are is a um, business case for operating with respect for human rights during the crisis and in the recovery phase. There are, in, uh, I will say, some indications that uh, companies who had well established uh, processes for human rights due diligence and uh, robust. Uh, engagement with affected uh, stakeholders have been um, uh, 
have been able to, to navigate the crisis and uh, including uh, where layoff was in, inevitable uh, in a responsible manner. So we have good examples as well. Huh? And, 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 uh, and that those who <clears throat> are beginning to come out of the crisis are, are better position in relation to their workers, uh, consumers, and, and uh, stakeholders if they have acted responsibly and, um, and, and are also seen to be acted responsibly. So and I think also governments can play an important role in incentivating responsible uh, companies, for example, by uh, having given them access to financial uh, aid conditional on companies who have been acting responsibly by meeting their the guiding principles of the UN. Thank you. So clear benefits for people and benefits for business as well. Director General, yes. let me come to you. Thank you very much. Yes, just to follow up on what the High Commissioner has already said so very well, uh, the, the effect on the pandemic uh, on, on the world of work has been cataclysmic. I mean, if you look at the numbers, they're four times greater than what happened to us in 2008, 2009. And if you try to apply that uh, those metrics to the discussion that we're having today, it's clear that this crisis has pushed up levels of poverty. Working poverty has gone up by 108 million <laughs> in the past year. And as you've indicated, Rachel, clearly for enterprises, uh, this is an existential threat as well. So I think the question is, in these extraordinarily difficult circumstances, how can we accelerate an agenda of business human rights at a time when you might think that the wind is against us, that everyone's in trouble and there's just not space or opportunity to move forward? Well, I think you can try and pick something positive out of the current conjuncture. That is to say, you know, at a time when everybody is talking about building back better, sometimes without sort of giving much content to that notion. Uh, I think it is true that the reset that inevitably comes from a crisis gives us a chance, when I say us, I mean the international community, I mean uh, public authorities, but also business, to just rethink how we do our work, how we interact together, and do better, frankly, than we have done uh, up until this point. So the ILO is busy working out an agenda for a human-centered recovery and we have to build in, I think, all of the lessons and all of the messages uh, of the guiding principles. It's often said, and I think with great justification, that the guiding principles have been a game changer in this agenda. And I want to congratulate everybody who's made that a reality. But the fact of the matter is, the game is still changing. Uh, and I would pick up on those who have already said, you know, we have to go from coalitions of the willing to those uh, companies and businesses which are very much on board with this agenda, we have to scale up, we have to generalize, we have to increase the pace uh, of change. Uh, and I can see two or three things that we need to keep in our minds as that is happening. First, this is a turbulent time, turbulent because of the economic consequences of the crisis. Secondly, and, and Michelle is much better placed than me to make this comment, uh, you know, the public commitment, governmental commitment to the protection of human rights is probably not on an upward trajectory at the moment. It's probably more space closing down than is opening up. And that is a challenge for businesses as well. And thirdly, we do have, as John Ruggie has indicated this, you know, this potentially game-changing debate, and we feel it very strongly at the ILO, about whether due diligence on human rights needs to be mandated because that is the way to scale up and generalize the specific, or if we're going to continue on the trajectory of voluntarist action. And if those you know, who, who think that the voluntarist path is the right one uh, are to prevail, I think we have to work out much more clearly how that voluntarist approach, which has been in action for some 10 years now, uh, is going to do a little bit better than it has done up to now. We can't just continue on a sort of the linear trajectory that we might think we're on right now. Thank you. Um, uh, conscious of the short time, unfortunately, we have today, High Commissioner, I have one question for you and then a separate one for, for the Director General. Um, High Commissioner, my question to you is about uh, root causes. We know that the pandemic has exacerbated poverty, inequality, lack of opportunities, especially for women and young people. Um, what can we expect companies to be doing about these root causes in their own operations uh, in line with the Global Compact Principles? Well, um, I think, I mean, I think that companies could, can help uh, 
But I, I, I think it's important to support uh, uh, and establish uh, creative incentives for collective action to address the underlying systemic issues, including at the multilateral level. I think that the financial sector, for example, has also an essential role to play by creating market-based uh, incentives. It can help address the root causes of these issues and drive positive change. At the same time, it is important to enhance uh, regulatory requirements to level the, the playing field, which will give uh, companies acting uh, responsibly a competitive edge and uh, sanctions uh, uh, laggards, I would say. Thank you. And that theme of the importance of uh, the role of regulation, along with other measures, I think, coming through clearly from, from both of your comments. Yeah. Um, Director General, if I can turn to you, yesterday we heard uh, very concrete commitments from companies uh, Unilever, L'Oreal, uh, Schneider Electric on living wage, and we'll hear further commitments today from others on uh, prevention and elimination of child labour. So these are really strong examples of companies trying to meet their due diligence responsibilities, as you were saying. Um, what do you think is the most effective approach to encourage more companies to do the same? Well, these commitments are great and they're, they're really good news. The ones that have been recorded and the others that are, are to come in the future. And by the way, we try to provide platforms at the ILO to bring people together to share information on how these commitments can be brought to fruition and made a reality. It's great news, but it brings us back, I think, to the previous question a little bit, which is we need to generalize the good examples of those uh, who are showing a, a way forward. Not everything, I think, can be laid at the door of business. Um, clearly, business wants to do the right things, but we do need that enabling environment. And that is a, a public policy issue. Uh, it's a way in which uh, companies interact with public authorities. And also, we have to work out, I think, as well, the metrics and the parameters by which companies doing the right thing uh, extract the advantages which they're entitled to expect from doing the right thing. There has to be a, le a level playing field which is based upon uh, the implementation of the guiding principles. So we've got a long way to go in those areas, I think. We do indeed. Thank you very much to both of you. And uh, there are many more insights that both guests could, could share with us all and, and that we would benefit from. And I'm sorry that we don't have time for more of them today. Uh, High Commissioner in particular, many thanks to you for joining us. Um, and I'm very pleased the Director General will be staying on with us. Um, of course, the UN General Assembly declared 2021 as the International Year for the Elimination of Child Labour and asked the ILO to take the lead in its implementation. And ending all forms of child labour is integral to the principles of the Global Compact. And we know that businesses have a crucial role to play in helping to accelerate progress to end these severe harms. Uh, the Compact has made the elimination of child labour a priority for this year to urge more companies to translate their commitments into concrete actions. Uh, and this session now on business leadership in time of rising risks of child labour is organised by the Global Compact in collaboration with the child labour platform of the ILO. So I'm pleased that uh, Guy Ryder will stay with us to give us all an update on progress and challenges. We stand at a midpoint, uh, four years on from the last global conference on child labour in Argentina, and four years to go to achieve the target set in SDG 8.7 to end child labour by 2025. Uh, last week, uh, on the World Day Against Child Labour, the ILO and UNICEF released new global estimates and trends under the banner of Alliance 8.7 on this topic. So, Director General, um, the last global estimates date from 2016. Uh, they indicated that 152 million children were in child labour globally, accounting for almost one in 10 of children uh, worldwide. Since uh, then, the pace of progress um, has clearly been affected by the pandemic uh, and the unprecedented ec economic crisis that, that accompanied it. Help, please help us understand where are we today? Thank you, Rachel. Yes, the estimates that UNICEF and ourselves published uh, last week, I'm afraid bring, bring us bad news because despite the progress that has been made since we began counting the real numbers of child workers in the world, we began back in 2000, despite the progress made since then, the bad news in our latest estimates is that child labour is actually on the increase. So having reduced child labour by some 94 million from the beginning of the century up until 2016, when our last estimates were uh, published, 
we now find that 8 million have been added to the numbers of child laborers in the world. We are at 160 million child laborers. And I have to make one clear point here. The figures, that increase of 8 million does not take account of the impact of COVID because the figures relate to the situation at the beginning of 2020. So the danger is that the COVID pandemic and everything that it has done will make these figures go up uh, even further. So not only are we not getting near to that 2025 objective of eliminating child labor, we're actually moving away from it. And that is pre-pandemic. Uh, now let's zoom in a little bit. Why is this? What's happening? What's going on in the field of child labor? Well, one thing we can see clearly from the regional perspective uh, is that child labor is uh, going up very, very quickly in Africa and more particularly sub-Saharan Africa at the same time as the downward trend in other regions is fortunately continuing. But the increase in Africa outweighs the improvements in other areas. That's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is uh, nearly half, almost exactly a half, slightly less, of these children are working on what we call the worst forms of child labor. That is to say child labor, which is actively dangerous to their physical or moral well-being. This is child labor, which very quickly destroys young people's lives. And that should, if nothing else, focus our attention. The third element, which I think is important to recognize, is that there is a high concentration of child labor in the agricultural setting. 70% of child laborers are working in agriculture. And looking a bit closer again, most of these are in the informal setting. I think this issue of informality is extraordinarily uh, important. Uh, and um, uh, the, the fact of the matter is that we are seeing uh, that these people are working very often in family settings as well. Difficult to reach. Now, why is this going on? It's not an easy question to answer because the period from 2016 to the beginning of 2020 was not a period of acute economic crisis compared to where we are today. I think this is a matter of, the, of simply we have taken our eye off the ball. The international community is investing less uh, in fighting child labor. labor. Uh, and this despite the fact, as a historic record shows, that we have tried and trusted ways of combating child labor. We've learned what it takes to stop child labor and bring the numbers down. None of which is to deny the complexities of the causes of child labor. When poverty goes up, when informality is high, uh, when family income is low, you're going to find child labor. So we have to pull several levers here to move forward again. We have to improve social protection and income support. We have to improve uh, access uh, to quality education because when it's available, families will do that much more to get their kids into school. Um, these are some of the elements, but we also have, I think, to ask business to step up in terms of uh, supply chain management, the exercise of due diligence in those areas. It is true that we're finding child labor you know, at the very end of supply chain. So it's difficult to reach areas. But again, with a commitment from business as well as government to move us forward, uh, we can certainly reverse what is un a very unfortunate trend in the wrong direction uh, when it comes to child labor, child labor developments in recent years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director General, for this uh, sobering update. Um, and certainly some clear reminders of, of what we all need to do. And I'm sure many of you listening today are uh, very motivated uh, indeed by the challenge ahead. Um, as part of the international year, uh, hundreds of stakeholders responded to the Alliance 8.7 call for action and made a pledge outlining clear goals for 2021. Uh, the Global Compact was one of the first organizations to submit such a pledge, which was focused on the commitment to mobilize businesses around the world in eliminating child labor. So I'm very pleased to introduce a video with concrete examples of the pledges made by companies and by Global Compact local networks. When we think about childhood, we like to imagine children who are free to play and free to go to school. Children far removed from the stress and strain of the grown-up world. But the truth is that globally, 
Millions of girls and boys are engaged in child labor every day. This is an unacceptable violation of children's fundamental human rights. Businesses have a responsibility to ensure that the exploitation of children is completely eliminated from their operations and their supply chains. And yes, it is true that many companies have made policy commitments to end child labor and forced labor. But commitment must be met by action. To bridge the gap between business aspiration and business action, the UN Global Compact has made a 2021 action pledge to mobilize businesses around the world in eliminating the scourge of child labor once and for all. Our 2021 action pledge to bolster the International Year for the Elimination of Child Labor is to collaborate with Goodweave. The mandate of Goodweave spans not only best practices and due diligence in the field of child labor, but actual operational boots on the ground inspection, monitoring, and certification of supply chains. In the unfortunate event child labor is found, Goodweave runs rescue and rehabilitation centers which have touched the lives of hundreds of children over the last two and a half decades, which have now been educated and repatriated with their families. We need businesses to take a holistic approach to child rights. We need them to collaborate in rooting out child labor across sectors and industries. We need every company to make ending child labor a top priority. Business has a key role to play, not only looking into their supply chain responsibilities and due diligence, but also in collaborating with local governments and other stakeholders. We are pleased to see that as a contribution to the International Year for the Elimination of Child Labor, more than 100 business-led initiatives are pledging to take concrete action to eliminate child labor. The Coca-Cola Company's cornerstone human rights policy strictly prohibits child labor. However, given the magnitude, complexity, and urgency of this problem, we also believe that multi-stakeholder partnerships are absolutely necessary to drive scale and leverage our collective strength to attack this dilemma. This belief led us to join the Child Labor Platform as a founding member, recognizing the benefit of sharing knowledge and strategies to reduce child labor and supply chains. We are also proud to engage in the Harvesting the Future project led by the Fair Labor Association. This initiative draws from a shared vision of FLA, the Coca-Cola Company, and other partners to bring about large-scale change on child protection, as well as responsible recruitment of adult workers by pursuing a multi-commodity, multi-company, multi-stakeholder approach. We do not tolerate child labor, but regrettably, child labor is present in some societies and across different sectors, including agriculture. It is a deeply rooted and complex issue, which requires a structure and long-term response to be effectively addressed. This is not something that any one business can do alone. It needs to be a collective effort involving government, public authorities, and civil society. All of us need to work together. That's why Ferrero has worked and continues to work with the ILO to eliminate child labor. Ferrero has a long-term commitment to sustainable supply chains. We have our own sustainability program, Ferrero Farming Values. In collaboration with trusted partners, we work with local communities to tackle child labor where needed. The education part on our part, it starts with our own employees. Our own employees in both our sales force and also from a procurement point of view must understand um, what role they have to play in procuring the product. We also share that knowledge with our customers. And the door is definitely opening with customers as they're becoming more and more interested in where the product is sourced from and whether or not child labor is obviously involved in this. And we play a key role in making sure that education understands all of the issues involved in their decisions. So a key from our point of view is people, educating our own, educating the customers, and educating and being firm with the supply chain. By setting clear objectives to our purchasing and origination teams, empowering LDC employees to enforce our commitments and policies, and influencing supply chain partners to adopt similar practices, we hope to contribute to tangible declines in the incidence of child labor and other poor labor practices in our supply chains. 
we will continue our efforts to address the issue of child labor and supply chains across our operations. This will include a whole range of measures, such as deepening horizontally and vertically our due diligence and risk areas, driving multi-stakeholder partnerships for our mediation, sharing learnings from such projects with our stakeholders, and creating new training capacity building models. Obviously our decisions have an effect. We, yes, we live the other uh, side of the world, but decisions we make will affect obviously children being involved in the procurement, children being involved in the production, and that is not acceptable. So we have to make sure that we are consistent in what we do. LDC has been part of the child labor platform since its inception 10 years ago via our membership of the Association of Cotton Merchants in Europe. We have found this platform immensely valuable as a forum to interact with and learn from ILO experts, as well as other member companies and organizations, benefiting from their shared experiences and actions in dealing with child labor issues. Global Compact Nepal is excited to work with Goodweave to extend the beautiful work that Goodweave is doing to eliminate child labor in Nepal, the region, and the entire world as we're all in this together. The ILO Child Labour Platform, as a partner of the Alliance 8.7 that I have the honour to chair, will help connect businesses with governments, social partners and NGOs efforts to eliminate child labour. I wish success to all the businesses that pledged this year and hope that many others will join us. Only by working together and taking collective responsibility can we build a world where children are free to be children let us do everything we possibly can to make that world a reality. I'm now very pleased to introduce our next segment, which is a conversation between three leaders of companies and an employer's organization uh, who each made an action pledge. So I'd very much like to welcome our three guests, uh, Ms. Lena Pripkovac, Chief Sustainability Officer of Interikea Group, uh, Mr. Mikio Sakai, President and CEO of Fuji Oil Holdings, and Mr. Khaled Abdelazim, Executive Director of the Federation of Egyptian Industries. Thanks to you all for being with us. Um, this will be a short conversation, but an important one. Uh, as the ILO's Director General has explained, for the first time in 20 years, we're witnessing an increase in child labour. Uh, your organisations all made an action pledge. Um, can each of you tell us the single most important impact on the ground in practice uh, that your pledge is intended to have this year in accelerating change on child labour? Ms. Pripkovac, let me come first to you. Mm. Yes, thank you. It's very uh, heartbreaking news to see that the trend is going in the wrong direction, of course, and very happy that we can be part now to focus on the acceleration that needs to happen. Uh, in our pledge, we've been working, of course, with the uh, elimination of child labor for over 20 years, but also realize that now we even need to accelerate even more. So in our pledge, we focus specifically on strengthening the children's rights in our human rights due diligence processes. And as was mentioned before here, that goes further down in the supply chain. IKEA has uh, a lot of industries uh, connected to our business. We're also looking in specifically to young workers. We know that a lot of young workers uh, are the age beyond, uh, sorry, the age under 18, but still within the minimum uh, working age, are unemployed three times more than others. So we've been working both in Vietnam and in Indonesia and also looking into other programs in order to actually make sure that there is decent work for young workers as well as education. Then I think the most important part has already been mentioned here today is the collaboration, collaboration with others. And we are also very happy to be part of the child labor platform, realizing that this is topic that has to be collaborated on and, and really make sure that we work on the ground and actions together and not just words. Thank you. Mr. Sakai, let me come to you, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Rachel. And I, I'm very happy and honor to be invited to, to join such an important uh, panel today. As Fujiro Group is the third largest producer of chocolate in the world, and caca bean and palm oil are key raw material. We are well aware of the child labor issue associated with the production of these products. 
uh, we have committed to removing the wor worst form of child labor from our supply chain by 2025 and to eliminating all forms of child labor by 2030 through our responsibility KKB procurement policy, which was formulated in 2018. To achieve these goals, we currently apply CLMRS, which is a child labor monitoring and remediation system as a tool to obtain metrics for traceability and transparency for caca bean sourcing and have achieved 26 percentage CLMRS coverage in our caca bean supply chain and have set the goal at 70 percentage for this year. Uh, we have taken measures to address this serious issue over many years now and have improved, expanded our efforts over the course of this time. Now that we know that the number of child, children uh, involved in child labor, especially in Africa, has increased now, which means that we need to accelerate our effort. However, our society and stakeholders still do not have enough awareness of this serious issue yet. So we hope that uh, uh, our pledge this year to reiterate our commitment will send a strong message to society and stakeholders, especially to consumers. That child labor is a serious social challenge and must be stopped. And that both consumers and businesses has an important role in dissolving this social issue, I think. That's it. Thank you. Mr. Abdelazim, please, what is the most important impact that you hope your pledge will, will have at FEI? Thank you very much. Um, really, the Federation of Egyptian Industries um, represents the interest of industrialists in Egypt, which uh, 95 of them are uh, SMEs. So uh, more recognition by member enterprises to the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, and how can they contribute to child labor mediation, whether in their own operations or in their supply chains, need to be uh, focused on. So this is the impact that we uh, are targeting. We want to educate our small and medium-sized enterprises on uh, uh, these principles, on the guiding principles, so that they can integrate it in their company policies and HR policies. Thank you. I think clear messages from all of you, uh, including on issues of partnerships, of robust due diligence, and of course, of awareness raising and, and education, depending on, on your position. Um, Mr. Abdelazim, let me stay with you. We just heard from the Director General that Africa uh, remains the region um, with the highest incidence of child labor. And of course, this is a very complex uh, issue to address. But uh, if you can, what in your view is the most urgent action that is needed in the African context in particular to, to make progress on this global challenge? Yeah, uh, it's true what uh, what uh, His Excellency Mr. Gaida, Guy Ryder has highlighted. 72.1 million children in Africa are still involved in child labor, and 31.5 are in hazardous works. So uh, Africa needs lots of efforts. I think that a better business environment that encourages investors to come to Africa, which is the starting point to alleviate poverty, because poverty is the main route behind child labor. Uh, so um, elevation of poverty, which is the main cause for child labor, is the first priority. The second one is set uh, free uh, basic education and apprenticeship programs for all children in Africa uh, should be a continental goal. Uh, and incentives to enterprises to participate and contribute to this uh, should, should be uh, also given. Thank you for, for those ideas. 
Uh, coming back um, to the role of the private sector and individual companies, we know and we've heard that a, a quite a large number of businesses have made um, uh, action uh, pledges of various kinds. But what we really need, as we've also heard, is to, to turn those into action on the ground. Um, as two companies that have made pledges and are focused on action, how, uh, in your views, do you think we can get more business leaders really acting on the commitments they've made? Um, Ms. Pr Kovac, what, what would you suggest? Mm. Uh, first of all, I think actually long-term commitments are extremely important in here. Uh, and with the long-term commitment, you will also be able to show what you can do. Uh, so good examples that needs to be scaled uh, and collaborate with others, you can also show what that actually means. Um, I think this is one of the triggers. Uh, I mean, the fact that you are uh, on a long-term uh, track uh, and looking into these topics, you can bring many stakeholders with you during that time. Uh, um, and we also learn from each other. I mean, we have many different local situations that differ. So as a global company in many industries, there are certain things that works very well and other places it's very challenging. So with the long-term commitment to scale these changes, you will also have to have many different partners. Um, so may maybe the biggest and most important one is that the good example speaks by itself. And I hope that that could be shared by many and the global compact is an excellent way of sharing those good examples. Thank you. Uh, Sakai-san, let me come to you, please. What, uh, what in your view, is, is most important? Yeah, thank you, Rachel. So this is a very, very important question. So biggest driver to act on the due diligence commitment is always the integrate our vision and purpose, which at Fuji Oil is to work for the well-being of society. But to do that, we need support and pressure from our stakeholders, especially the shareholders and consumers. We conducted uh, human rights due diligence twice in 2017 and 2020, and found that our supply chain is exposed, exposed to serious human rights risk. So we explained to shareholders that child labor is not only a social problem, but also the very serious business risk now, and is facing more regulation, such as the EU due diligence registration. And together with our client food companies and the retailers, we should engage with consumers and explain that child labor free chocolate is more satisfactory to eat. Thank you. And I think that's an important point, which is we're seeing, I think, now um, the uh, real. Uh, overlap between very severe risks to people, in this case to, to children, some of the most vulnerable, and to young people, as uh, um, as you were saying, Ms. Prickovac, uh, coming together with business risk, uh, with regulatory and certainly reputational risk as well. Um, so maybe that does create a, a indeed more of an opportunity for for action. Um, Mr. Uh, Abdelazim, the Director General also mentioned, the High Commissioner mentioned, uh, the challenge of uh, child labour um, often being in the lowest tiers of the supply chain, certainly in small and medium uh, businesses, and particularly in the informal sector. Uh, and that can be much harder to address um, through typical uh, due diligence systems, although, of course, not, in, not impossible. Um, what do you think are the two or three really essential steps to tackle child labour in those particular types of labour contexts? Yeah, I think that the, the most essential steps to tackle child labor in these labor contexts are uh, addressing the root causes. Many informal enterprises, many informal businesses can be described as vulnerable businesses. So inequality in business brings inequality in practices. We need to give focus, more focus on strengthening small and medium-sized enterprises formalizing the informal, not for the sake of collecting more taxes, but for the sake of providing an opportunity for growth that will help or enable enterprises to have more responsible business conducts and work ethics. 
In addition to that, uh, working in partnerships with SMEs, and if I can add, finally, uh, extend social protection to all. Uh, social protection in society is not only addressed for individuals, but for small firms as well that, uh, that, will be, that can be hit by such incidents as the pandemic, which will affect their businesses, forcing them to reduce cost by all means, even if they are going to host, if, even if they are going to um, employ uh, uh, child labor. So the, the point is, whenever there is more programs for social protection, there will be a better room for, uh, for uh, uh, monitoring the performance of these firms and uh, asking them to achieve higher level of compliance. Thank you. I'd like to come back to um, uh, what you mentioned before, Ms. Kovac, in, in IKEA's pledge, uh, which is really focused uh, on, amongst other things, on creating decent work opportunities for younger workers, as you were saying, a really important cohort. Can you tell us a bit more about this aspect of your pledge? Mm -hmm. I think uh, it actually goes very closely to the, the taking a risk as a company as well. I mean, many companies do not want to employ uh, young workers because you are looking into the age of 18 because it does require extra effort. But it's also those topics we have to tackle in order to eliminate child labor and also make a safe environment for young workers. So we have been working with uh, different uh, programs within Vietnam and Indonesia, and we will uh, strengthen that and see if we can do even more. I also would like to add that when we are in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic situation, that we also need to separate what is crisis management and my, maybe financial support in a short period of time and what is the long-term uh, focus and, and ability to actually keep track on these programs for unfortunately a long time until everything is eliminated. So yes, we will continue to work very much with the decent work for young workers because we think this is one of the root cause of very severe, uh, unstable uh, situation for young workers. Thank you very much. And I think reminding us in your comments of the need to take both a long-term perspective, but also to um, really tackle uh, aspects of this work that seem hard or difficult and that need more resources, um, because I think we're all very aware of the urgency. Thank you very much to all three of you for your commitment, uh, for your action and, and for your comments today. And we'll now hear uh, a brief announcement from the International Organization of Employers. We launched the International Elimination of Child Labor Changemaker Award 2021 to honor those incredible employers' organizations demonstrating extraordinary efforts to combat child labor. The award is just based on three criteria, innovation, impact, and sustainability. I am pleased to announce the prize winners for this year. Gold Award goes to Camara del Agro in Guatemala for their very valuable business network initiative, Boys and Girls at the School. The Silver Award goes to Fundazucar in El Salvador for their work in the sugar sector. And the Bronze Award goes to the Federation of Kenyan Employers for their incredible Adopt a School initiative. Congratulations to these three important federations. All the details related to these important initiatives can be found in IOE website. I will now give pass to our Gold Award winner, Camara del Agro, to say a few words. It is such an honor to receive this award on behalf of all our members and the employers' organizations of Guatemala that are also members of CACIP. And a special thanks to the sugar industry, the National Coffee Association, the NEO Entrepreneurs for Education, and all of the other government and non-government organizations whose programs and positive results we have linked it through the Child Labor Prevention Business Network. Child labor is something that goes beyond the formal sector. Therefore, the commitment of Guatemalan employers goes beyond our industry policy of not using child labor. And because of that, we are promoting programs to contribute to accelerate our country's path towards SDG 8.7. I would like to thank the International Employers Organization for the astounding work in making sure employers' success stories and its contributions are globally recognized. Thank you to the other members of the jury, the Kalash Foundation, and the international labor organizations for their support. And last but not least, congratulations to all other organizations that were recognized today. And thank you to all employers around the world 
that despite many challenges are inspiring each other to support and promote private public efforts to make sure not only we can end child labor, but we can also have a bigger long-term impact in our communities and our countries by demanding the quality of education system as the only sustainable way to reduce child labor and secure a future with opportunities for all children. I'm very pleased um, to now be joined by my two final guests to help us reflect on what we've heard today. Uh, I'm glad to welcome Roberto Suarez Santos, the Secretary General of the International Organization of Employees. Thank you, Roberto. And of course, Sharon Burrow, the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation. Welcome, Sharon. Um, it's clear, I think, that if we want to end child labour, uh, we are going to have to recognise uh, our distinct and complementary responsibilities as stakeholders, whether we are business, uh, trade unions, governments, um, or civil society or UN agencies, uh, and work together uh, even more than we've been doing already. Um, and I'd like to ask the two of you to, to help us uh, really work through. We've heard several pledges today and also concrete actions from companies and business organizations, but we've also heard and, of course, are aware of the very um, sobering uh, way in which the pandemic has exacerbated risks to children amongst other vulnerable stakeholders. And from your perspective, what is most important to focus on in the next four years uh, to really try and achieve the goal of ending child labor? Uh, Sharon, let me come to you first. Thank you, Rachel. Well, we're having this conversation on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the UNGPs. These were a game changer and brought great hope, but the voluntary nature of these principles have not worked. So the very first thing we need to do is mandate due diligence with the other two pillars of grievance procedures at all levels and indeed, uh, of course, uh, to affect remedy and then to monitor healthier supply chains. Just to give you the context, 94% of the workforce is in, in supply chains is a hidden workforce. It obscures dehumanising exploitation, poor wages, insecure, often unsafe work. And some 2 billion of the global workforce are in informal work. No rights, no minimum wage, no social protection, day-to-day -day survival. And many of those are parents of the children forced to work. And you heard the statistics today, an increase in child labour, almost one in 10. That's before the pandemic. That's just impossible. And uh, therefore, we need to acknowledge there's little to celebrate, but a lot to do. And we must all take responsibility because we eat the fish that these children harvest, the chocolate, the coffee, the other agricultural products. We wear the textiles whose supply chains they were found in or consume the technology for whom these children mine the rare earth minerals. We know the solution, so what are they? We know that in fact, uh, we must provide quality public education, stop denying children a childhood, but that means social protection for their parents and jobs to be created. And of course, we need to make sure that uh, there are, there's the rule of law to criminalize breaches where people simply lack the will to make the change because good companies are trying to do the right thing. But, of course, when they're undercut in the global marketplace by, you know, such, you know, absolute exploitation, then that's got to stop. You have to acknowledge that if we don't fund, indeed, public health and education services, along with social protection, largely the responsibility of the state, then we're not giving these children a chance. But also, governments now have a chance with the UNDPs to mandate due diligence, to install the regulatory framework. So as I said, that's got to be a first priority. But we can also all take responsibility. If you think about, you just talked about Africa, let's just take a couple of countries. If you actually look at uh, um, the DRC, it's a pathfinder country, part of Alliance 8, it's uh, committed to demonstrating commitment. It's committed to ending child labour. There are companies who are part of the child labour platform with us and under the auspices of the Global Compact. If we identify this country as a priority, which has been done, then what can we do about it? What should we be doing about it? Well, with government support, working towards a national collective agreement for the mining industry, with unions organising workers on the ground, for formalisation and better wages, 
and indeed for, with global agreements between multinational companies and the Global Union Federation, we can actually work together to, to identify the source, to, to make sure that child labour is eliminated and that we work with the governments to put those other uh, conditions in, in place. The OECD has been an important uh, actor here already, but we need them to do more because their guidelines, indeed, in terms of the complaints process, are also voluntary. They have uh, spawned, indeed, the uh, guidelines for the mining industry and there is a responsible mining industry coalition. So we've got to all sit down, get the plan, identify the source and simply eradicate the, the behaviour of companies. But let me also say on a second case that the government of Ghana has also made similar commitments. We stand by as unions ready to work with the government and employers to put the plan for human rights and due diligence in practice to eliminate child labour and fishing. Or we can do it in cocoa. We, can, we know success models success, Rachel, so we can get similar plans in every country, but we have to get have the will to work together at the national and at the global level with all actors in place, everybody taking responsibility. Do we have the will to do so? That's the question for today. Thanks, Sharon, as always, for putting the challenge to us and for giving us such concrete uh, country examples as well of what can really be done. Um, Roberto, let me come to you. What do you think is most important uh, for us to focus on in the next four years? Listen, uh, the figures we have heard about this backlash in child labor are simply unacceptable. I mean, the fact that we have one out of 10 children in child labor, but even more worrying, the fact that we'll have seven, eight million new children in child labor is something that we have not witnessed in many years. On the company side, we have, I have to say, a consolidated trend. The company's efforts on due diligence are there. We have to recognize it. More and more companies are taking seriously the duty to respect, the reporting, the, the, the having also important measures to ensure access to remedy. We also have more regulations and also reporting. But I would say that the way of making business is on this trend. I mean, uh, when we talk about what what's the future of business, there's no other way of making business if you don't take seriously the due diligence. The frustration that we have is that in too many countries, the context of weak institutions, corruption, lack of education, as Sharon was saying also, huge informality, uh, and that's the pending, the pending challenge that we have not been able to effectively tackle, the lack of compliance culture, make all these efforts hard, difficult, and very, very exhausting. So if you ask me what's the next push, what's the next trend, I think that is effective partnerships. And I think the UN Global Compact also with us, with the workers, um, with, the, with the different actors, different stakeholders have a key play, uh, a key role to play. And the Alliance 8.7 also gives us an example of how we need to do things in a different manner. We need to go hand in hand in these efforts with institutional progress in education, institutional progress on decent work, institutional progress also on social protection, and we're going to give also a push on that. We need also to better integrate some of the due diligence approach also on other companies, but we need to act together. We have not been good. I have to be very clear on that. We have not been good acting together. We have to identify these areas, these challenges, which make us more clumsy when we go together. And that's the way forward. And that's the big push for the next year, for the next three or four years. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more that both of you uh, can say and that your organizations indeed are providing in terms of guidance to, to business and to governments. Um, but I think as you've both emphasized to all of us, frankly, to take our personal responsibility seriously and our collective responsibility seriously. It takes hard to, it, it's hard to work together uh, and to take that, uh, take that challenge up, but we, we clearly need to do it. Uh, we must do it. So thank you very much to both of you. Um, and indeed to all of our participants today. Uh, we've highlighted what's been achieved, uh, including in the 10 years since the UN guiding principles were endorsed, um, but also how much is still to be done. And I think we all uh, share, that, um, share that commitment. I look forward to continuing that work uh, with all of you who joined us today uh, and now hand the floor to the Executive Director of UNICEF, 
uh, who will conclude our session. Thanks again to you all. On behalf of everyone at UNICEF, we thank the UN Global Compact and all of our partners here today for their efforts to end child labor. We have accomplished so much progress on this issue in recent years, but there is more work to do. The new global estimates released last week show that global progress against child labor has stalled for the first time in two decades. Not only have absolute child labor numbers gone up, but the ongoing COVID-19 crisis threatens to erase our hard-worn progress and place our commitment to end child labor by 2025 out of reach. Families are facing economic hardships and millions more children are at risk of being pushed into child labor. This represents an alarming call for renewed action and investment around a number of proven solutions that can end this practice. Extended social protection coverage to erase the economic pressures on families. Better access to education and schools to keep children learning instead of working. Birth registration for every child. And stronger laws and regulations to protect children. At every step, we need the help, influence, and action of the global business community. Responsible business conduct in line with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and comprehensive business actions that address the root causes of child labor are all essential. UNICEF calls for decent work that delivers a fair income for adult workers and their families. And we call for government regulations and policies that incentivize businesses to help address the root causes of child labor, including for the informal economy. We are all in this together. Joint action and advocacy by businesses, governments, and other partners are critical to ending this practice once and for all. Together, we can create a world free of child labor. Thank you.